Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word proclaimed, that we may hear with joy what you have to say to us today. Our scripture reading this morning comes from the prophet Isaiah and Paul's letter to the Corinthians. Um, please hear these words from the prophet Isaiah, verses 149. Come, all who are thirsty, come to the water. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cause. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me, and eat what is good, and you will delight in the richest of fare. Give ear and come to me, listen that you may live. I will make an everlasting covenant with you, my faithful love promised to David. See, I have made him a witness to the peoples, a ruler and commander of the peoples. Surely you will summon nations you know not, and nations you do not know will come running to you. Because the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, for he has endowed you with splendor. Seek the Lord while he may be found, call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord, and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. This time I would invite David to come and share our New Testament reading. Good morning. Good morning. Today's reading is Corinthians 1, 10, 1 through 13. It's a warning to us from the Old Testament that God wants us to be aware of our life today. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under a cloud and they were all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now all these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Do not be an idolater. As some of them were, as is written, the people sat down to eat and drink, and got up and indulged in revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality, as some of them did, and in one, as many as 23,000 died. We should not test Christ, as some of them did, and they were killed by snakes. And do not grumble, as some of them did, and they were killed by the destroying angel. These things happen to these as examples and were written down as warnings to us on whom the culmination of the ages have come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you do not fall. No, temptation has overtaken you except that which is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide you a way out that you can endure. The word of God, the people of God, thanks be to God. Thank you, David. So I think many of you today can already figure out what this message is going to be about. But before we go in and we talk about coming hungry and thirsty before God, I have a reflection that I want you to think about. So think about a time in your life when God has called you back to Him. What was going on? And what was that experience like for you?
Now, maybe for some of you, when you think about that time, you think of a very dark place in your life. While maybe others of you have never really experienced the real drastic darkness in your life, you've always kind of just gone the, the, the straight path, and yet maybe you found yourself, yourself meandering off just a little bit. I have experience in both of those areas. And in the first one, I was in such a dark place that my faith was hanging on by only a thread, and I was just seconds away from this casting it all away, saying, you know what, everything I believe or have been taught is a lie. But then there's also been those times in my life where things seem pretty good, you know, I'm comfortable, I feel safe, and then pretty soon I just think, you know what, I can handle this, God, I don't need your help, and pretty soon I begin to meander off down here. And yet, in both of those situations, there was a firm call by God to say, Josh, I need you to come back. You're going the wrong way. And in every time that I look at that, I find that oftentimes the things that I had neglected were to come spiritually hungry before God. And I tried to satisfy and fulfill those needs with all of the things that the world had to offer. All right? And those times left me empty and disappointed, frustrated. So today as we look at the scriptures, as David said, we see here at first what looks to be a warning from Paul as he addresses the church in Corinth. And he says, for I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under a cloud and they were baptized through the sea. And he goes on to list some of the things that the people of the Old Testament, the Israelites, endured, okay? And some of these things are pretty miraculous, amazing things. So think about this. The people had been led out of Egypt. They follow this cloud of wind and smoke and fire through the desert. They're given manna and quail from heaven to eat. Rocks open up and spill forth water when they most need it. And yet oftentimes the people complain about the very things that God is doing. So in fact that they see this great big pillar of cloud and smoke and fire, they grumble. And so, and when they're nourished by the manna that comes down, they complain, oh, we don't want to eat this stuff anymore. We want some meat. Give us some other stuff to eat. And I think many of us look at these, these passages and we go, oh, how did they even do that? But yet, how often do we do it in our own lives? How often do we neglect the things that God is doing? Sure, maybe perhaps most of us haven't followed around a pillar of, of cloud and smoke, but yet, if we would take the time, we would find that God is indeed working in our lives, and we have just failed to notice that. But God again calls us back and says, don't, don't forget the promises. I have something much better in store for you. As we look at Isaiah chapter 55, the prophet gives us an invitation to abundant life. Come all of you who are thirsty, come to the waters, you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. You will delight in the richest of fares. And so God, I'm going to say, has prepared a never-ending banquet for you. All you need to do is come and have a seat at the table. All right? Now, maybe for some of us guys, that looks a little too fancy, and you're just like, just give me some steak and potatoes, and I'm good. But you can have an all-you-can-eat steak buffet if that's what you want, all right? Now, I understand that this picture is also a little bit deceiving because it can imply that things in our life, if we just follow God, everything in our life is just going to be great. Oh, we're just going to come and we're going to enjoy this banquet. Life's going to be easy and we're going to coast. But I think we all know that that's just simply not the case. That sometimes bad things happen in our lives. And yet, even in those darkest of times, even in those most difficult of times, God invites us to this table and says, come and eat. The food I have for you will get you through this spot. Remember the promises I have given you. And so let's look at some of the promises, some of the covenants 
that God has given to his people over time because this is what they're called to remember. So we look first at the covenant with Abraham, and God said, you know what, Abraham, if you will follow me, I will give you offspring, I will give you land, and I will give you universal blessing. Abraham does that. Yes, he struggles along the way, but he does it. And God eventually fulfills it, even though Abraham didn't live to see the fulfillment of all of them in person. Next, we see another covenant made with the Israelites. God leads them out of slavery in Egypt, he gives Moses the Ten Commandments and says, you know what? I am still going to fulfill the promises that I gave to Abraham. I'm going to lead you to a land that's filled with milk and honey. And I want you to be my people and represent me when you go into that land. I also need you to live by these rules that I'm going to give you. And if you follow the rules that I give you, you'll be blessed. If you don't follow the rules, then you're going to have a rough time. Bad things are going to happen. We look at the covenant with David and we see again the continuity of these covenants played out. It's through the Davidic line that we see the ruler and the king and eventually Jesus who comes to fulfill many or all of these old covenants. And we're given a new promise in Jesus himself. The new covenant is God's culmination of the culmination of his saving work in all of us. When we put our faith and trust in life in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven of all of the sins that we have, and we are made right with God. We then go through a process what we, in church terms, call sanctification, where we continually are regenerated and renewed through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's important to understand these promises, to understand these covenants, because if you don't, so much of Scripture doesn't make sense. And so covenant real simply is just a promise in a relationship. So most of us here know what it's like to be married. We've seen married couples. But think, even if you've never been married, think of just any relationship that you have. That relationship requires that you pour into that relationship. Because just as I told the kids, if you don't feed yourself physically, you're eventually going to get sick. Your body will get sick. The same thing goes for any relationship that you have. If you don't put time and energy into that relationship, you're going to get sick, or that relationship will get sick. Whether it's a husband and wife, a brother and sister, whatever it is, it will lead to an unhealthy place if you don't feed it. And folks, we too need to feed ourselves spiritually. Now, God also in this process calls us back, and in the process of calling us back, he says, you know what, seek me, call on me, and I will forgive you of the things that you have done. You see, sin always makes us turn our back on God, and sin always leads us away from God, and the ultimate result of sin is always death. And yet repentance calls us to do an abrupt face, to turn completely back around and begin to walk back to God. And as the scripture says, he will freely pardon any of those that come back and seek repentance with a right to heart. Now, as the, the great philosophers known as Aerosmith would say, we learn from both fools and from sages. All right? And so, one of the things that we need to do is we need to look at history. And I think most of you know that my degrees are in history, so I have a passion for history. And one of the things I love about history is I love going back and seeing the developments. I love seeing the processes and the patterns that go on in civilizations and in culture. And so in verse 6 here, Paul is talking about, again, looking back at the Old Testament and seeing all of those miraculous things that God had done for the Israelites to show his presence among them and to lead them in the right direction. And so we learn from some of the good things that we see. Now, I don't know what it is. Apparently, we're just kind of slow learners because it sure seems like as humans, we learn a lot more from our mistakes than we ever do from our successes. And so Paul again warns us too that, look, we need to learn from the things of the past. 
And he goes on in those scriptures to name some of the sins. Idolatry, sexual immorality, grumbling to God. Okay, all of the things that I believe the church in Corinth were struggling with at that same time. So it's not like it was anything new to them. And so, folks, we too have to learn from the past that is before us. We don't need to live there. We don't need to dwell there. But we need to live there. Or live there. We need to learn from the past. All right? And so, folks, you know, I find that uh, this is a, just a little bit of a tangent, but I sometimes get worried when I look at the state of our, of our world and the state of our country, and I see some of the patterns and ideas that are going on right now in our culture. If we look back into history, some awful bad things have happened given this line of thought and reasoning that we've gone down. And if we don't learn from these things, we stand to be in a little bit of trouble like that. So hopefully we learn. Hopefully, rather than thinking that we have the right way, that we as human beings can solve everything, we need, again, to go back to God and say, look, God, how are we supposed to live? And I need to come to you, and I need you to fill me up so that I can do the things that you're calling me to do. And Paul goes on to talk about temptation and testing. And it says, no temptation has overtaken you except for what is common to mankind. And God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. Now, I think to some degree, some of us really struggle when we hear verses like this. Some of us who maybe, like I said, just hanging on by a thread or in really a dark place, we think that it's too much for us to bear. I think that's why we see things like suicide. We see the rates of depression continuing to rise because these people have lost hope and they say, you know what, I just, I can't deal with this anymore. And yet God assures us that, look, no matter what you're going through, no matter how bad things are in your life, I will give you the strength that you need to come through. Yes, it's not going to be easy. But I will give you the strength and the comfort and the peace that you need to go and get through this situation. Now the words temptation in this verse can also be translated as tested. And some of us don't really like to read the verses that way because we don't like to think of God as testing us. Okay? And when I think about testing, God is testing our faith. Now, use for example something like cancer. Do I believe God gives us cancer and says, well, here, figure out, deal with it? No. But I do believe God will allow our bodies to have cancer, but it will require that we come through this and say, you know what? I can't do this on my own. I need your healing. I need your love. I need your strength to get through this. All right? And I have seen firsthand, I have seen people who have had cancer and they've turned their focus on Jesus and it has revolutionized their life. And maybe they didn't completely get killed from it, but they were on point spiritually. And it changed their lives because of the transformation that they had. On the opposite side, I've seen people who just get devastated by the disease and they go completely the opposite way. And so, folks, there is a choice in this. That we have to come to God and allow God to do the work in us. Come to that table. Come hungry. Come thirsty for the things that he has for us. Experience the healing and the love that he has in store for us. And again, we always need to remember our place. You know, here in, in the U.S., we tend to take individualism as one of the greatest ideals that we have. It's all about me, me, me. I did this, I did this, I did this. And yet, we have to remember that we are only finite beings. We have a God who is infinite, a God who can see the whole picture. We don't see the whole picture. Half the time, we can't even figure out what's going to go on tomorrow, let alone for eternity. I can't remember what happened two days ago, but God can see throughout all of history. All right? And so we need to be careful and remember that it's God who is in control. And we need to think about the fact that we are not in control because our thoughts are not God's thoughts. God's thoughts are bigger than our thoughts, and His ways are bigger than our ways. So remember our place. Remember who is in true authority. So I ask you today... Are you hungry for God? Are you prepared to come to God today and say, you know what? I need you to get through this day. Maybe things are going great in your life. 
but don't fall into complacency and apathy. Still come hungry and thirsty for God because if you start to coast, eventually your body is going to be unsatisfied. Your soul will be unfulfilled. You won't be giving your soul and your faith the things that it needs to be healthy. And folks, we live in a world that is very hungry for God. Maybe they wouldn't say that, but I think that's what it is. I think that's why we see so many of the problems that continue to rise up. And we try to solve it on our own, but it just doesn't work. People are hungry for God because there's a void, there's a hole left in their hearts that they long to have filled. But like me, so oftentimes we think we can do it on our own and we seek things that are only temporary fixes for that void. Mother Teresa said in her book, A Call to Mercy, people are hungry for God. What a terrible meeting it would be with our neighbor if we gave them only ourselves. And I think of how true that statement is. That when we are focused on only ourselves, when we fill ourselves up on only the things we think we need and we don't go to God, how do we show up when we relate and interact with each other? Do we fulfill and do we lift those people up? Or do we just leave them temporarily satisfied? So folks, it not only affects us, but it affects the people that we love. It affects our neighbors, our community, and the world. So as I leave you today, I have some action steps. The first one is, I hope that you will engage in daily activities that feed your soul. As I told the kids, we should be in scripture, we should be in prayer, we should be worshiping, we should be fasting, we should be engaging in the spiritual disciplines, those things that truly fill us up. Now the extra caveat to this is I want you to make a note of it. Now I'm not a really good journaler, so I'm not going to ask you to journal unless that's what you like to do. But you know what? Keep a note somewhere, even if it's on a piece of scratch paper, and say, you know what? I read scripture for 15 minutes today. And I noticed a difference in my day. And this is how it changed. Because oftentimes, we go through these activities, but we get so busy and so wrapped up in stuff that we fail to miss what God is actually doing in our midst at that time. How many times do we pray and then just think, well, I left it up to God and that's it. And we don't actually see the answer to prayer as it comes along. So make a note of the differences you see in your life as you do these activities. Second, as I said, I really believe that the, the world is hungry for God. So there are those people, perhaps even in our pews and church today, who are really struggling. Give them a call and give them some love and some encouragement. Call them, send them a letter, whatever it is for you and that person. Let them know that you're there and that you care for them. And then friends, again, we have an invitation to invite to an endless table all of the people around us. So invite those people in our neighborhoods and in our communities and even within our families who are really hungry for something more. God bless you all.